Hey everyone, it's Jason. Welcome to another uh, unboxing for Six Siege, the board game. Uh, first video, I kind of went over the uh, base components of the game and just the general idea of what the game was. I kind of went through, looked at all the different pieces, uh, but didn't take a close look at them. This one, we're going to kind of go over the rules a little bit more in depth. Um, and I'll do more videos where I actually go over the actual characters and stuff a little bit uh, further. Now, this isn't going to be a full uh, sit down, let's how to play the game. I just want to go over the basis of the rules. So that way, when I'm talking about stuff like going through the characters and all that, you guys have some idea of what we're going through. Uh, but we will run through the pretty much most of the rule book. I'm not going to read everything word for word. Um, but we do want to look at some of the main things of the game. So, of course, we want to look at first is the core concept of the game. Um, so what is this game? It's a tactical uh, shooter game, essentially. So each player commands a squad of operators, either are attacking or defenders, each a unique means of achieving victories. The attacker begins outside the building complex, whereas the defender is hidden inside. Uh, it's six rounds, um, with each five different phases. So the attacker gets to go, then the defender, then the attacker gets the second phase, then the defender, and then an upkeep phase. During each activation phase, each player takes turns to activate some of their operators, each of will perform one movement action and have two additional actions. Um, so, yeah, like, change the terrain, do all that stuff. Um, do everything. So, have, uh, aim of the game. Uh, so, there's basically three different game modes. There are control missions. Attacker and defenders compete for areas of control in order to score victory points. We recommend control missions. You play as is easy for learning. Um, yeah, so... And then there's bomb missions. The attacker must defuse one of two interconnected bombs. The defender's goal is to stop them. And hostage. The attacker's objective is to extract the hostage from the player. The defender must prevent them. Um, so it kind of goes on with some increasing difficulty. So control missions, you're going to get little tiny. I don't have them sitting right here. Uh, little tiny square tokens. They'll be across the map. Um, let me grab one of the mission books for that. Bomb starter. Uh, bomb hostage. I was see if they had one for just that. Yeah, so we have like they just have the starter examples in the mission book here. But for example, like in this map here, we're gonna have controls. We're gonna have these little tokens all over the board. Um, and then how basically that works is you have to be controlling the room, meaning you can have the only player to have your operators in there. So orange team have orange, which are the defenders, or blue has only blue. Um, but you collect them. On the turn that, um, on the turn round it is. So, like, round, at the end of end of round one, if, um, somebody's in, like, only one person, like, mute here, for example, is only in this room, then Orange Team will collect the one point. Nobody will collect any for the rest of the rooms. Um, but that's, like, if you're, the, if they're, unless they're disputed, if you have both players in each area, then... No one gets it, and then, then it goes to round two. That gang of round two, if there's if a, if a one token is still disputed, it's fine um, until it's undisputed. Um, and at the end of a round, if anything is undisputed at a number or lower, it's either collected by the team that has control of it, or it goes away. So that means if by round two nobody has gotten into this, it will just go away and disappear. So then you'll have to try and move to round three. So. Getting from one area to the other quicker um, makes sense. And then, like, five, like, you don't want to have people sitting in five right away because you have to wait till the end of the game to actually get into there. So that's basically how that goes. It's kind of like trying to, like, maintain an area so you have to defeat your, the other players or try and keep them out of that room by maybe watching it. Um, bomb is pretty simple as well. You can get your little bomb tokens. And then there will be bombs in various parts of the map. Um, and the attackers have to get to one of them. And they use an action. They start deactivating it. It turns into one of the blue bombs showing up here. And then they and it, they can win the game, basically. Then the other player has to try and get over uh, and turn that bomb off before the end of the round. Um, so it says specifically there. So, victory. The attacker wins the game if either bomb is disarmed by the end of the overtime round. 
Um, the Fenger wins if both bombs are primed at the end of round five. So the Fenger can keep both bombs going, they're fine. Um, but the attackers can win as long as they disarm one by the end. But that means you're going to basically keep your operators in that room. And they're going to have to deal with them. Um, and then the last one is hostage, which is very, very simple. You're trying to extract the hostage from the location. The attacker wins immediately on extracting the hostage. Defender must prevent them. The hostage has not been extracted or is not being escorted by the end of round five. Or the hostage has not been extracted by the overtime round. Um, and you can pass the hostage back and forth between characters. I think that's what makes that kind of like the third difficult because the bomb, you have two objectives to go for where the hostage only have one. So the hostage, the defenders can all just focus on that one target the entire time. Um, they go up a little picture down here of how the game kind of plays out. I kind of want to jump through some of the other rules before we look at that and then just make it easier. Um, so we're going to have just a couple of sizes. So like one defenders on one side, attackers on the other side, game supplies. Doesn't really matter which side you're on. Just saying that, you know, you shouldn't be sharing the same side necessarily. Um, there's some different environments. There's the main floor and the upper floor. So as we look on the map, everything is the main floor. Except then you can use little uh, arrows here to go up and down to the up, up and top and bottom. So then each side will have a top and bottom. And there's a blue one down in the bottom corner down here. Um, and that's kind of just basically it's the upper floor is just the upper floor. You don't really play around and maneuver in there. So whoever goes upstairs can kind of freely move in between these things as they would like. Um, and then the main floor is broke down. Just kind of look at the map here quick. Broke down to a couple different spaces. So each of these white spots here, I'm going to zoom in on these a little bit. A little bit better. So each white spot is a square. That is where one of your operators can stand. Um, we can have various different operators in different spots there. Um, and then these white spots here are for various pieces of furniture. So this game comes with a little buildable furniture. So if it has two, then you put a double one on there. If it would have a single one, uh, such as, if I scooch over to this side, we have a spot there. You put a single piece of furniture. Now, it doesn't really matter what piece of furniture or obstacle goes there. Um, you can have it kind of themed to the thing. Maybe have a desk in a certain area because you're playing in an office. You can have the pool table. It, it doesn't. That in itself doesn't make a difference. They're just there to block. Um, so your operators can hide behind them uh, for a line of sight. They block things like that. Or traverse, traversing areas. Um, operator wants to go over it. They have to spend extra points. So it's either they have to run around it or they can try and hop over it quick. Um, and sometimes it's, it's about the same. Sometimes it's a little bit cheaper to do one versus the other. Um, yeah, of course, it's very important since the map is basically like your main game components. It's very good to know what all these different things do. Um, adjacent spaces are anything around a character that they have a line of sight to. Um, line of sight, I'm going to flip back to this side, is defined my imaginary straight line linking in central dots in two spaces not broken by any of the fallen elements. A partition, a space containing smoke or gas overlays, space containing an operator other than the targeted space. Operators can drive along a site in any direction at all time. So, in the center of these little uh, symbols, you can kind of see it. There's little tiny white dots. So, as long as you can draw from one of those dots to the next dot, um, you have the line of sight. So, I'm going to pull this out of the way for a second. So... Right now, if these two guys were staying here, they can obviously see each other. If this guy's here, he's obviously not going to be able to see him because there's a wall in the way. Um, and that's all it can take. But even if they're standing right here like this, there's still technically a wall in the way. Because if you check the center of this square to the center of this square, it would draw a line through that um, part there. And what is nice is the game does come with little rulers, too. For, for some reason, you're ever confused... Um, and you're disputing this, you can go ahead and line up 
those two and you can see it goes straight through there. So it's very helpful for trying to do stuff. And I actually made a really long one as well for if you're really trying to check a very big line of sights. So if you're curious if the operator standing here can see this guy way over here, because it's quite a bit of space. And now right here is normally a wall, but let's say that wall has been destroyed for whatever reason, and there's actually a coating to represent that. Actually do a, a broken wall coating. Um, so now you can see through that wall. So you just pull all this stuff out of the way, and you measure from this spot here, Two, and he was at this spot here, and you'd see if there was any lines broken. So it'd go all the way through, since there's no wall there, but it would hit this corner right there. So he wouldn't be able to see him, just because of that little bit. Um, but that's, yeah, it's definitely a thing there. Plus, then the fact is, once you get this piece of furniture in there, you know, that, that can make a difference too. So, like, obviously, he can't see him behind the, the furniture. Um, you just assume that your, your player is probably naturally, like, crouching behind this table or this desk or chair or whatever it is. Um, yeah, and then, like, so that so you can then see it in any direction. You can't see through walls and stuff like that. Um, area capacity. Space is containing no more than one operator or one gadget. Um, a space with an operator and obstacle is considered occupies the spaces are free. A room consists of a group of spaces that are denoted by little arrows in the corner. This is showing, if they have those, they're like, just not in that corner. We have some in there. Those are showing those are actual rooms. Um, as opposed to, if we scroll over here a little bit, this stairwell is not considered to be a room. Or... This uh, little space in here is not considered to be a room. And that's just important because there's various um, abilities, like especially for being upstairs, there's abilities that are called vertical, so they can shoot down into rooms. They can't shoot down into a stairwell from upstairs um, or into some of them. So like, even with something like this, this is a big giant open area, it is technically not considered a room for the purposes of what a room is. Um, so yeah, those just make a little bit of difference there versus gameplay stuff. Um, and then they have a little perimeter. So I'll have a little uh, barricade around it. A little, I'm, I'm pointing at something that doesn't exist. Um, but yeah, they'll have these little borders around it to show the space. Now, even though these ones I showed before that don't technically have... Um, don't technically have little arrows to say they're a room, they still have... Um, the little icons on to show it this is its own square. Um, it says, applies, uh, additional rules apply to a room that have the arrow icon. So they're still technically a room, but they can only be used for, uh, vertical, um, icons. Uh, the dark green spaces around the edge of the game are preferred as a perimeter spaces represent approaching the building. So if we look at those... So anything in these big outside spaces and then the arrow lines start to fade, this is where the attackers start from. So you can start in one of these spots. Um, and that's where they can start anywhere along that one outside edge. Um, but like they can't start in here because that technically has a little perimeter around it. So I'm just going to show it's a room. Uh, important. Walls thickness and their... Uh, Thickness and the chair have no influence on the gameplay. Uh, decorative elements printed on the game board are not are not obstacles. Walls, windows, and or icons have no impact on the game. This means gameplay is unaffected by pots, plants, railings, and other things such as that. So that's just shit. that's saying like up here we have pictures of these desks and stuff. They don't actually account for anything. There's like a rock on that part of the board um, way up here. That doesn't mean anything per gameplay. Um, none of that stuff matters. What matters is we have the big giant wall lines. Um, we show our different walls. We have our different uh, other symbols we'll look at. So, we have windows and doors. Uh, doors are represented by one or two sections marked with a cross. All doors are shown directly in the game board as being opened. Windows occupy the one or two spaces. If anything, 
including windows, have this little exclamation point, it costs one move to move through them. So if we come down here, I'm going to see if I can zoom in a little bit closer on this. So our doorway right here has a little tiny X. Kind of hard to see, but it does. And our window is right there. So that means let's just say we can go through these as doorways, but we can actually put barricades up in the doorways, um, which are one of the extra elements we have. Um, so you get these barricades, which we'll go through a little bit later. Uh, more detail, but you can put them up in doorways. So now this guy can't go through that doorway unless he puts it. It's just saying that so that way you know that the X is X where they go. So you can't put them anywhere you would like. And then we have little tiny ones that also are for windows. Um, but this one would be for a single window, like such as over here on this part of the game board. And that would prevent um, the operator from... So if he wants to come in here, he can't just hop through this window. He has to spend an action to destroy this barricade. Then he has to spend a movement point to get through the window. Um, so depending on where those are, that's also going to make a difference. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. Got a couple more map things to go through. We have... Uh, zoom back a little bit. Walls and barricades are collectively referred to as partitions. Uh, wall spaces covered... A, a space section covered by a wall is a wall section. A wall consists of one or more wall sections in red. Some cases leading to a protruding section with a little blue square. Wall represented by a white outline, which is part of the wall. So, um... I don't even know if we have any of those for sure on here. We have the white ones. Um, I was trying to see if we had any of the red ones. I'll, I'll look in just a sec. Let me what, finish going through all the different types of walls. Um, I think they're just... Oh, I think it's actually, it might just be showing that that's how the walls are. I don't know if they're actually right on the map. Um, a wall consists of one or more wall sections showing in the red that that's a wall. Some cases protruding to a white section. Um, there are four types of walls. Heavy walls may provide heavy protection to operators, are indestructible, area capacity, wall-mounted gadgets, may only be mounted on heavy wall sections. A wall section can accommodate one gadget which falls into a space in which it faces. Um, fortified walls provide the same level of wall as a heavy protection but can be destroyed by gadgets with the red destruction rating. Light walls provide light protection from operators, can be destroyed by using the orange or red, and hold walls provide the same level of protection as light, but does not block line of sight. And these are in the expansions. Um, and then we kind of talked about the barricades a bit. Barricades may be placed over doors or windows printed on the game boards, provide light protection against operators. A barricade is represented by a standee and can only be destroyed with a yellow, uh, red, or orange or red. Um, so what this is saying here is if we zoom in here is uh, big thick walls you cannot destroy. Um, they're always going to be there. I going to be protected. Sometimes we'll have one of these. This is a light wall. Um, so this can be destroyed. Though anything that can be destroyed will have a symbol on it. Um, and whatever the symbol is means the level of destruction either your gadget or operator needs to have to destroy it. Yellow is the weakest, orange is medium, red is the hardest. So your barricades will have the little yellow icons. Most walls will be orange, um, but then we will have, way up here at the top, we'll have a red one, um, which is red, or sorry, a, a heavy wall. Um, you also tell kind of by the patterns on it. So this is just two lines um, where the light walls have a bunch of different lines. So they have more in there to show that they're a little bit weaker. Oh, uh, it's just showing so that way you can break through different parts. Um, and this is just, again, how your operators can get through and around the buildings. Because they can come into one room, and then they can break these walls open, get rid of protection behind them. But the defenders can also use that to their advantage, too, because they can have an attacker hiding behind one of these walls. So if, like, we look even, like, right here... Um, 
let's say, our, um, zoom back out, our orange, our orange defender is turning, and he sees this wall here, and he knows this guy's hiding back here. He could destroy this wall, and then we would put up again one of our little broken walls there, and now he could shoot at him. Um, yes, it was providing him protection too, but it might be more advantage at times to destroy it. The only problem is once a wall is destroyed, a wall is destroyed, right? Um, so that's pretty good. Then, speaking of that, we have breaches. Represent rubble from destroyed walls. Covers and replaces one or more walls such and do not block line of sight. But they do have a little exclamation point, uh, just like the little windows did, which means they cost one extra movement point. I love that there's all the icons on the items just to let you know. Obstacles occupy a single or space or extend over multiple spaces are indestructible, do not block line of sight, and may provide light protection. So I did say here he would be hiding behind him. It's not going to prevent them from seeing him, but he is going to take less damage because you could assume if he's crouching, maybe he's only going to get hit in the shoulder or like the leg if it's pe peering out or however, but he's not standing up to take like a full on like chest shot. Of course, if he's ducked down, he might take a head shot, which is bad, but, um, so then your furniture or obstacles, we usually have that little exclamation point on them too, to show that they cost extra to hop over them. So like this one will have it like on the outside of the leg. So yeah, it's very helpful that they put those on there. Uh, we do have structural element. Type of space represent impassable structural element is surrounded by heavy wall. Can never be targeted, no gameplay can never be placed in that space. Um, and then entryways, we mentioned a little bit earlier too, our spaces on the main floor to allow you to go upstairs. All operators can use a great entry space to move up or down. Blue entryway spaces can only be used by attackers. See moving between floors. Um, meaning overwatch token and fortified entry. I'll go over that um, a little bit later. Uh, Cause that's another mode. Um, Actually, it's actually talking about it right now. So we'll just go over that right now, I guess. Um, each squad is an upper floor area consisting of two spaces. These spaces represent the existence of other floors in the building. I'm going to quickly shoot and deploy gadgets. Um, only defenders may use orange spaces. Blue spaces are ex uh, exclusive for are exclusively for attackers. Um, spaces upper floor are not used... Or actions can be adjacent to other or adjacent to the entryways on the main floor. However, some actions rest are restricted uh, to be in them certain areas. So they'll tell you on their abilities where they can be used. Um, each space on the floor can accommodate no more than one operator representing a miniature or hidden operator token. The line of sight. An operator in the upper floor has line of sight to all great entryway spaces. Note that the line of sight extends no further than the entryway space and attackers Operator is an upper floor, also is going to say to all blue entryway spaces. Uh, this last site may be blocked by an opposing entry entryway overwatch token, a fortified entryway token, or gas to smoke overlays. So basically, what that means is I just to break it down. If my my defender runs over here, hops up and hops upstairs, using an action to go upstairs. I would then move him over to the corner of this board, and it's showing I only have two spots. So I can only have two guys upstairs at one time. But now he has the ability, um, and I actually have to put a token down there, because I don't have my tokens. Can I grab one quick? I did not grab one ahead of time. I'm trying to see if I can move my tiles to grab one of these. I know this won't match the character, but what you do then is then way back over here. I would put this is for Castle. It's probably not who I have, um, but I put this here to show that he went up this ladder. He can kind of watch that hole. Um, but now what he can do is essentially is if this guy happens to be in this room and he's coming over here, he he's standing on this location. He can now shoot down and attack him because he's underneath an open way. You have to assume these are like like ropes going up or, or stairs or something like that. Um, and that's 
pretty much what they can do. Then they do sometimes have ability that are called vertical abilities on their uh, character cards, which will let them attack anywhere inside the room with the little arrows. Um, so, so that kind of being safe there. If he's worried, oh no, that guy's upstairs. He can attack me in one of them areas. He might jump into here, or he might take this and go upstairs to his side. You know, as a way to avoid being attacked. Um, yes, yeah, so it's kind of basically you can move around, assuming that they're moving anywhere on there. Um, but what it's also saying is that if this guy's over here, he can't jump on here and climb up because he's assuming that. I uh, put my card back over here. Assuming he can't climb up here and go there because that guy's watching that area. Um, so yeah, it, it's it's pretty interesting. And then if we go to the outside of the board, um, something like, oh, here, this is a blue one. So this means the blue ones are always only on the outside. Uh, that just means the attacker, only the attacker can get there. So that means if he, beginning of the game, he could jump here, he could go upstairs on his first action. Um, he have to spend one. He can't do it. He can't start there at the beginning of the game. He can't, yes, start outside the building, but he can scale up essentially and go inside the building. And then he could come down on a later turn, you know, on his next action or whatever. He could come down into here and jump into this room. Um, so that's always a possibility to do as well. Um, but the defender could never pop up outside the building. The defenders have no reason to ever leave the building. Um, all right, so that's the basis for our kind of map and that. Now we're going to look at some of the um, operator movement and abilities and stuff there. All right, so this is one other thing. I, another thing I really love about the game I think is cool for the defenders. So operator is represented by one of two different things. Either they're going to have the actual miniatures out, which we've seen, or they will have two hidden operator tokens just for the orange characters. So this is for like the basic recruit. Um, but you have two different ones that he places on the board somewhere. Um, and if we flip them to the other side, one side has this picture, one side has an X. So how this basically works is when the orange player starts the game out, they could put this token here showing that he's there, and they could put the other one, uh, like, up over here, facing that direction. Now, the attackers don't know which one is that character, and then during the orange player's move, he could be like, oh, you know what, uh, I'm going to move him, uh, you know, two spaces over to this one, and I'm going to move this one, you know, three spaces, like, two spaces that way. And they can split the movement the operator has up, and then the attacker doesn't know which one's which. So instead of dealing with five enemies, they're technically dealing with potentially ten enemies on the board because they have two for each character. Um, and then let's say he moved next turn. My blue guy moves in. He attacks this guy, right? He attacks him. He flips him over. Oh, it was actually the recruit. So then what you would do is then you, you could swap them out and that, and you pull the tokens back off the board. Now he knows where he is. Um, but yeah, he could have, if he attacked the other guy, he would have still found out, oh, that's the decoy, and then the other guy w could have been revealed as well. But you don't know which one you're going to attack. And you now you can move any of these. Like if you had, again, if we had both of these on there and I have five movement, I could just move this guy five spaces. I would not have to touch that. And I could do that again my next turn even with that. I could move him over here. Um, and you could leave that one just sit there. Your opponent doesn't know. Are you moving your decoy around? You know, just for giggles? Or are you moving your other player in action leaving that guy? Or you can split him up. Um, yes, yeah, so it's kind of a fun little mechanic for the game. Um, but we do have statuses. So we have... Status marker located. Operators have been located when hit by a shot action. They also, they also may be located by a drone camera or special gadget by placing a special little red marker located marker on them. Reveal hidden operators that reveal a marker. Line of sight to locate operators no longer broken by white walls, barricades, and spaces. So basically what this means is that if I had him here, and he gets located by this guy because he shot him um, and revealed him. 
is that then you just gotta come over. I put one of them little red tokens. I don't have one right next to me, so I'm not gonna grab one. Um, but now that means other he he is now located for all the other attackers to know that's where he is. Um, at least until as long as he's still in the line of sight and everything. So there could have been, um, you know, so if it was on this side, and let's say he shot him here, and I had another blue player um, over here, and this is a white wall, even though he can't technically see him because there's a wall between them, he would know he's there. Um so he could try and break down, you know, he could shoot through this wall and try and go after him. Because he knows he's there all of a sudden. Now he's like, yep, I know that's where that guy is. Um, yeah, so the last side is no longer broken by white walls, barricades, and spaces containing gas and overlays. So normally the white wall would break a line, would cover a line of sight because he couldn't see him. But it would allow some of his abilities to maybe trigger through there. Um... Yeah, so it's kind of fun. So you could, so it, it's a neat way of like, it makes sense for a tactical game. If player A sees enemy A, and they're like, hey, they can be like, yeah, this guy's uh, on the back side of the kitchen wall. Like he's in the kitchen. Now all the other players know where he's at. But if for whatever reason, let's say he did this, he shot and got rid of him, killed him. Um, and then this was still blocked off so he couldn't see through this wall. Uh, during the next turn, this is this is an advanced rule of the game. But potentially, what you could do is then he could go back into hiding. Then, when he starts moving, he could move his tokens different directions, and now everyone has to find him again. Which again fits very well with the tactical nature of the game. Um, once no one can see the guy anymore, um, there's no reason for him not to be on the board. Uh, you can also use stun markers. Uh, operators stunned by a flashbang or a special gadget place a little exclamation point marker on their base. Operators of Porm shoot action will stun roll two yellow hit dice instead of the dice that they normally roll. So they still get to attack, they just get a very reduced attack. Um, there are a couple other things to go over for each character, so I'm going to skip right here. Revealing hidden operators. The attacker's operators begin the game revealed. They're always revealed. Defenders, on the other hand, initially are hidden each operator, represented by the decoy and a portrait, uh, and they may look down at any time. Um, unlike operators, makers, two hidden tokens, each occupy a space blocking a line of sight. So you can't shoot through. So if this token was there and this guy was revealed, and this guy was standing right here, he can't shoot through this token, even if it's a decoy. The only way for him to do that is he would have to be on with the other player's turn is he would have to reveal oh that's that so this would go away then you put this guy out here and then that's how you would do that now he could shoot through because there's no one there otherwise it would still be considered as if there's an operator in the way um so overwatching hidden operator in overwatching hidden operator decides uh who to repost is i who blah blah blah, blah. and Overwatching hidden operator who decides to repost is automatically revealed to the shot resolve. And hidden operator wishes to perform a reaction enabled by his gadgets by doing so is, has no need to reveal themselves. Um, so what this is basically saying is reveal a hidden operator by the defender. The defender may decide to reveal at any time in order to perform certain actions. So normally they can only, if you're hiding, you can only move um, like move around. You can't move around or overwatch. You can't attack or shoot people or you can't use like grenades or special objects like that. There are some objects you can do for a reaction, like maybe sending out something. Um, and then repost is basically someone walks into their line of sight, you can get a free shot on them. Uh, but again, if you're performing that attack action, now the guys are obviously gonna know where you are. Um, revealing hit or op hitting operas by the attacker. Um, the attacker may at any time and without spending action ask the defender to be able to hit your operator token falling situations. If the hitting operator is in direct line of sight of one of their own operators, not just in a space or overwatching, defender may challenge the claim of line of sight. 
if the hidden operator sustains one or more wounds, or if one of their operators uses a gadget in a hidden location. So, again, what this means is as soon as he sees him, he can be like, he walk. He blew up this wall. He walk. He blows up this wall. Let's just say he blew up that wall. He doesn't need to walk through. He can now see this character. He can be like, "Hey, I need you to reveal him. If that's your hit, yo, know, I need you to reveal that guy, right?" Um, or if he threw a, let's say he was over. He was uh, maybe like way over here, and he sent a drone that came around and spotted him. He can now say, "Hey." That drone spotted you, you need to reveal. Um, you know, or if they throw a grenade, let's say they throw it, this guy happened to be standing right over here and he threw a grenade that blew up and did damage to him. Again, he could be like, you took damage, so now you have to reveal your, your guy. Um, so, kind of, kind of showing that here. Um, Ash is entering a space. The line of sight one of smoke's hidden operator tokens. Um, Ash has deployed a drone in which enters the room containing one of smoke's hidden operator tokens. The drone stand reveals the token's true nature. So it went down here and it's going to reveal whether that was that. Or he's throwing a grenade into the air containing one of smoke's hidden operators. Revealed token if he sustains one or more wounds from the grenade. So you do get a roll for damage first. If for some reason you didn't take damage... You don't have to reveal them because you don't have to be like, oh, no, there's no one there to take damage. You can roll for defense first um, if for some reason. So we do have a couple other things here. We have status marker overwatch. So we do get these little tiny mo markers here, which you can put on your characters that show the overwatch, um, which is the same thing that's on the front of your tokens. Um, and overwatch is... A special condition, which we'll get into in just a minute here, but basically lets you kind of watch or survey an entire area. Um, and then we have the eliminated slash in play. An operator who sustains a number of wounds equal to or greater than their stamina is eliminated, remove their miniature and all items on their profile and put them back in the box. Flip the operator's profile to show eliminated. Any gadgets deployed by the eliminated operator remain play. So if you play like a camera, it would stay out. Um operators can just be in play until eliminated. Um then we have some various things about the actual operator, which we're gonna go over a little bit later when we actually probably go through the operators, but just a quick run through is the top ones are gonna show their range. So how far away they are, how many dice they did roll, their special actions they did do. Um, if they decide to run, it'll either be 2, 5, or 0 if they're too heavy. How many things they can destroy and their kind of armor. Um, we'll look at that a little bit more when we get into the operator. Um, effects of revealing hidden operators. Place a revealed operator miniature in the space. Uh, contains this token in indicating their true position. Leave the orientation indicated by the marker. Uh, place an overwatch marker in front of the miniature, showing the previously overwatch direction unless revealed player is currently in their activation phase. Then put two hidden operator tokens back to the box. Um, this is, again, unless you're going to use the um, the advanced technique, which I 100% think you should just use, where then they can potentially hide again. So you just want to set them off to the side. Um, these operations are not actions. Do not trigger reactions. Um, so that means like this guy gets revealed. It's not triggering something that's going to cause them to shoot somebody else or do something extra. Um all right, so that's the basis for that. I want before we go to setup sequence, I do want to jump over into um, overwatching because overwatching and moving and all this stuff make a huge difference of the game. Um, I'm not really as worried about setup as much right now. So we do have your different options to move. You have during your actions, your actions your character can take during a turn, and again they get one move action and two alter alternate actions. So you can have move, run, overwatch, shoot, use a tactical gadget, destroy, or use a special gadget action effect. Revealed operators can do all of these at any time. Hidden operators, though, for the defense team, can only move, run, or overwatch. They can't do any any other action, which would essentially reveal their location. Um, movement, you can spend up to five move points. 
or runs by up to five move points depending on the operator's profile. So that could change. Some operators can run farther than other. Um, and then from upper floors, spend one movement point to access the main floor via the uh, movement, then spend the remaining movement points. Um, for overwatching, reorientate the operator. Overwatch space in the highlighter's line of sight is now indicated by the marker. Um, for on the upper floor, place an entryway token or a neutral token on one of those or move them. So you can move your token to different ones. Uh, shoot. Shoot an operator in line of sight, or located, or locate the target operator. Um, tactical gadget apply the effects. Destroy move destructible elements from the game board if you have line of sight and the correct destruction rating, or apply a gadget the effect. Um, so for shooting, tactical, or destroy, you can only use them in one of the three areas with the arrow on them. So it's very limited being on the upper space for doing some of that stuff. But where you get a little bonus is apply a special gadget or action in a neutral area or one that says vertical in any one of the rooms. So guys that have the room ability are going to get a lot of advantages from being up there. Um, moving an operator is pretty simple. You have five points of movement. Operator may move orthogonally or diagonally, so left, right, up, down, or any of the cardinal directions. A cost of one per space, so, um, but you can't obviously move through walls, so it'd be one, two spaces there. Um, operators can not enter spaces with opposing operators, must move through spaces. Um, can move through spaces with a squad mate, but can never stop or end their movement there, and cost one extra through going through areas of exclamation points, such as obstacles. So this is kind of fun to look at how this works. So for Sledge to move all the way across to point where it says A, he's going to have to spend six points. If he goes completely straight, he's going to have one point to go through the window here, and then two points. He'll have a third point to get up on the desk, because it has an exclamation point. So there's his fourth point to actually move on to it. So that's one, two, three, four. Gets a free space across, so that's five, and he gets a free free one off, so six. Or if he went the same way, two, you could go diagonal for three, four, five up on top, and then six back down. Or you could go one, two, three, four, hop off five, six. So th this way he's avoiding the barbed wire here is what he's trying to go around. But yeah, either way it's going to cost him six points to get across. He's not going to get, um, get either way all the way across. Uh, he must spend six movement points requiring him to use the run action. Um, to whichever route he takes, he's always going to have to spend six points to get to that same spot. But this can help you get around various obstacles, um, or, um, traps and things like that. Um, pausing, pausing a move action. Players may pause a move action after entering a free space, perform one, of two, one or two available actions, then resume their movement. Spend their points... Many movement points in the normal way. Active player splits their action, counting each movement step separately and announcing the number of remaining movement. Um, you can pause multiple times. So what this is kind of saying is, um, for this action is, you could have your character do this, as he could move one, two, spend an action to shoot him, right? That's... Ill, and he still has a couple more move points, he could go 3-4 and then come back and hide behind this wall, potentially, right? So he might pop out to shoot him, run back in. Um, or he might do the other thing. He might have been here, do 1-2-3, shoot this guy for, uh, well, he would have to do 5-6, and if he had 6 points, he could try and then get back into this other hallway. So it's kind of like a run and gun. You could run, stop, shoot the guy, um, come back in. He'd probably want to be like one, two, three, four, shoot, and then five like that. So there are different objects, options you can do there. This is kind of cool. Um, or if you're saying if you were going upstairs, you could do like one, two, come down a different action somewhere else. You know, let's say he went from a different one, came down here. If you land, come down here with his third one, four or five, and he could move somewhere else. 
Um, there's also a leaning mechanic, which is pretty cool. Um, operators, whether revealed or hidden on the main floor, can lean to gain a line of sight while remaining protected. One movement point for an operator to lean orthogonally adjacent space. So orthogonally means up, down, left, right. The non-diagonals. Move the operator's miniature in a space in which they're leaning and place their leaning standing on which they're leaning. Um, so yeah, it's kind of showing here is that so, mute before leaning. Um, he can't lean onto furniture. He can't lean through a broken wall. Um, but he can lean left or right. Um, and then we have the little leaning tokens, which I have the blue one here. So, what it's saying is, if this guy was right here, but he wants to look around this corner to see what's happening, he could spend a leaning token. he move his character there. So this is showing this is where he normally was, and it's showing him essentially doing this. So he's looking out uh, around this corner, but it's going to put his thing there. So if, like, he was normally here, he's like, I can't shoot this guy because there's a wall in between our two white dots. But he could spend an action to go a leaning, lean around this wall, it's assuming this wall was uh, a barricade here. So now he can see through it. He can shoot this guy. You know, and then you can also use movement points then to keep moving or running away. Um, but it keeps him protected. Because um, now if someone tried to shoot him, still half of his body is still around that corner. Um, so a leaning operator occupies two spaces on the game board containing their miniature and one containing their standing. Um, a leaner leaning between two rooms is present in both. A operator can be targeted by targeting either their miniature or their leaning standing. So this is kind of saying, I, we use this as an example. He could have been over here in this room, and he wants to look into this room, right, to see what's there. He could lean like that, which, if this wall was breached, right, he could see this guy. But now he's in both rooms. So our other operator could come from over here. He could shoot this part of him. You know, definitely a thing he could do. Um... That's kind of a neat little awesome attack. Leaning standings never block line of sight. Operators cannot move while leaning, so you have to unlean to move. Um, leaning operator uses a space containing its miniature and forming actions that require line of sight. Uh, leaning has the same effect in gameplay as anchor in space. For example, if leaning's in going overwatch space, now they can shoot at them or repose. Straightening up. Uh, straightening up costs one movement point doc. Operator may straighten up in two ways. Either move onto the space containing a leaning or move into the other space. So if he's leaning, I can either be like one space, he's he's in that spot, he stepped forward, or I can move him back. So either either direction. Um, leaning and straightening up have the same effect as entering a space, potentially triggering a repost from an overwatching operator. Moving between floors. Uh, moving from the upper to the main floor. So in one movement, playing to moving to one of the two spaces. In either space, the upper floor is free. The operator must remain on the bottom floor. So you can't go hide all your characters upstairs. Um, once in the upper floor, operator cannot spend any remaining movement points or perform another move action. So you can use one point to move up upstairs, but you'd have to then, if you're coming downstairs... Um, you can spend one to move down ways into an entry space... Um, operators that leave the upper floor cannot return to it the same activation. So you can't run up a ladder. Basically, what this is saying is he can't, he can't be upstairs, come down here, shoot a guy, and then go back upstairs. He's got to spend one point. He can come down here. If he still had some movement points, he could, you know, move away from the ladder. If he goes upstairs, though, he's upstairs. He can't then run. Like I did say before, he could go to another area but not on the same exact move spot. So I did probably miss, miss said that. The wrong action lets operator make an extra movement during their activation. It grants either two or five movement points, depending on the value showing on the profile. So that means a normal movement is seven points. If an operator decides to run, it's going to instead give them either seven or 10 points to move. Um, so give them some extra points if they can. Um, other actions we can do, of course, is shooting people. We like we like to shoot people. It's a shooting game. 
Operator performs a shoot action, card in opposing operator in line of sight is known as a shooter. Uh, line of sight operator is not broken by light walls, barricades, or overlays. Um, as they can be carded by shots fired through these elements. So, you can shoot through these things, um, but you have to be able to know where the character so they have to be, like, located, um, to be able to find them. Um, so if you're playing the app, you have to pause the app when you're doing all that. So doing all your regular movement, moving around, app keeps running, timer keeps going, but when you do your shooting, you pause, so that way you can make sure that you're all, can check all your stuff and all that. The player controlling the targeted operator either states they approve the line of sight um, and its protected conditions declared by a shooter, in which the case they proceed to the next step, or indicates you do not approve the conditions and challenge the shot. Um, calculate the distance from the shooter counts each space in between the shooter, including uh, the target space. Um, so it kind of does like movement. It moves one, two, and then three, and then four. Um, so his line of sight has to be from the center spot, you know, to the center spot. But then when you're actually checking for spaces, it's not diagonal. Or it can be diagonal, but you have to count the spaces. So you can go like one, two, like three, and then you just go four, and then five. Or you could go one, two, three, four. Um, but as long as you get to that, or five, and you get to that space, um, you still have to count each shot, just kind of like moving. After telling the distance you're for the operator's profile to determine their range. Um, the range effect number is colored as dice. The symbol ha target has protection, you not roll any lightning bolt symbols. Uh, treat shot fire from the upper four as short range. Uh, roll all hits, hit dice, add up the number of hit symbols to determine if the target operator is protected. Um, treat as follows, subtract two if there's light protection or three if they have heavy protection. Um, and we'll get to that is right here. So, um, that's protection for leaning operators, but I don't think it makes a difference. Um, all right, so the final result in your case, the indicated, who uh, indicated card is one wound per hit. Operate only literally if the total number of wounds is on their stamina. If the target operator remains in play, place a located hit on their base, even if they sustained no hits. So even if you shot at them, you'll get them. Um, then restart the timer. Protection target operators may gain light protection of minus two hits or three. If the lighters, shooter's line of sight passes through any of the falling elements. Um, so if it goes through a heavy wall or a fortified wall, um, they get minus three. Um, squad mate carrying a shield gets minus two. Um, obstacles. Uh, the target must be situated in adjacent space to the obstacle. Um, a hold wall, a barricade, or a light wall, it's minus two. So, like, in this situation, if he just straight was shooting this way, right, that he's shooting through, now, if this is just a regular light wall, he could shoot through that light wall, shoot him, but because he has two things of protection, actually adds up to actually being three. Because it gives him cover. If he was here, he would still get two. So, sometimes that's why you might have to make one, two, he might want to jump up and shoot, but then also he's a little bit closer. Um, yeah, so the, the line of sight and stuff make a big difference. Uh, so here we got Smoke is shooting Ash, who's in a leaning position, so they're showing him uh, leaning over against heavy protection as the line of sight uh, is passing through one. So this is showing if he's using a leaning token, it's going to count against both of them. So both parts of his body. Um, so there's, although leaning is very helpful, it can also be a detriment in that sense too, because he's, he's keeping himself protected. Um, oh, sorry, he's shooting this direction, I guess, but because part of his body is covered by a, a wall, that means he gets, he gets the protection that way. And here it's showing it the other direction. So it's showing Ash is shooting smoke, so going this way, who's located and leaning. Um, gains heavy protection with combination. Line of sight passes through a light wall. So at least one of their two shot, both of them actually go through there. And it's also passing through an obstacle. 
Because one goes towards that, one goes towards that. Um, yeah, pretty cool. So you get some extra defense from various stuff. Um, and then here's a third one. Um, Ash's life progression is adjacent. As he is adjacent to an obstacle, the ashes line is just passing through. So even though his diagonal code is still technically adjacent to it. Operators carrying shields have a permanent light protection. Um, then we also have free actions. Some actions cause players to perform other actions which are treated as free actions. Reactions also are free actions. Free actions never count towards the total of the three available actions. Whenever a free action triggers a repost, unlike the initial action that led to it. Um, for example, during his activation phase, Pulse spends only one of his three actions to perform using a special action. Heat, sen heat Heartbeat Sensor, once complete, this action may prompt a reaction by an opposing operator, but the ensuing shoot action is free and never triggers an action. Um... Yeah, so him performing the one action doesn't do anything, but, um, it, yeah, if we get the other one. In a second action, Pulse can therefore perform any action, including shoot, except use a special gadget, which he's already used. Alright, so I know a long video, a lot of stuff to take in. Um, I think what we're going to do is we're going to pause this. I think we're going to break this down into two parts, since there is still a lot to go over. Um, in here, so we went over the basics of the movement and some of the barricades and all that. The next thing we have to go through is going to be the overwatch, which is a little bit more in-depth. Um, and we'll get to some of the other actions, the tactical actions, destroy actions. Um, and then some of how the different gadgets and stuff work. Um, so I think, yeah, we'll come back, we'll do a part two for the rules. So if, yeah, you really want to see the rest of that. Come back, check out part two. We'll finish up the rest of the actions. Um, otherwise, this is already an, almost an hour-long video, and you probably don't want to watch more if you don't have to. All right, see you guys then. Bye.